George Atley was a missionary in the Central African Mission back in the 80s. And uh, he, he was there uh, working with Africans in, in Central Africa. And one day in 1989, he was confronted by a band of, of hostile tri tribesmen. And uh, he had a very important decision to make uh, because he knew it wasn't, there was a potential this wouldn't, wouldn't end well, right? Uh, he was carrying a fully loaded 10-chamber uh, Winchester rifle, and he had to make a, a choice. If he defended himself and shot one of the hostile tribesmen, it could potentially damage the mission and the message and everything that that mission had been saying about Jesus and about faith and about kingdom life. And he also knew if he didn't defend himself, uh, there was a, a high chance he could die. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, nobody knows what really happened, but sometime later his body was found in a stream, and not too far away was his rifle, all ten chambers still loaded. Atlee would rather die than potentially compromise the work of the gospel. Atlee would rather die than possibly hinder somebody from coming to know Jesus in a saving way. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard the, the name George Whitefield before. He was a famous English preacher back in the day. Uh, he, he prayed, Lord, give me souls or take my soul. Henry uh, Martin, a missionary to India and Persia, is known for his passion and his desire to reach the lost. And he's remembered for a prayer that he prayed when he reached India. And he said, here, God, let me burn out for God. Praying hides another missionary in, in, the India, in India, and he pleaded, Father, give me these souls or I die. There's some passion. The Apostle Paul, missionary in the Middle East, wrote in Romans chapter 9, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. It won't stop unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. In other words, if, it's as all, if it was at all possible, I, I would trade the fate of my soul eternally if I could trade it for them, that they could go to heaven and I would miss it. Man, that's passion. That's sacrifice. That, that is willing to go to any length. Obviously, he couldn't trade his soul for the souls of the people he knew. But he, 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 he had this burn in his heart, this anguish in his heart for his fellow people to know Jesus Christ. I, I, I was, most of you know, born, mostly raised in Des Moines area. I lived in Clear Lake for a few years and came back. <clears throat> and uh, first church was here in, in Des Moines. And, and then we moved to Atlantic for uh, 11 years, Atlantic, Iowa, and, and, and really loved it there. But when we would come back home to visit family, friends, shop, whatever, uh, I, so often we would drive in through the western suburbs and, and head toward the east side. And, and through 1990 through 2001 is when we lived there, right? And so that was a year, of, still a year of time of great growth. But my man, the suburbs were just growing like crazy. West Des Moines was growing like crazy. And uh, we'd come in, and, and it just it kept expanding. Uh, apartment complexes and, and restaurants and commercial stuff and just buildings and buildings and buildings. And we'd drive in through all this new area, and, and, and I'd have that, that, that ache, you know, because, because I knew what Jesus had said. Jesus made it pretty clear. He, he, he said that wide is, is the road, you know, and many are on it that lead to destruction. And narrow is the path that leads to, to, to heaven, and few are on that. So I'm just, just going by what Jesus said, not, not knowing anybody, not knowing any specifics, I, we would drive through the burbs, <laughs> the, the outer reaches of the morning, and, and I would just be like, most of these people don't know Jesus. What, what are we going to do? What can we do about that? And I would pray. I, I would pray every single time. I would pray, God, bring someone to reach these people. They need new churches. They need churches that are there to, 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 to you know, reach out. They need believers in their lives that they work with. Reach these people. Time after time after time, I, I would pray that. And what often happens is the more you pray a prayer like that, uh, God finally says, well, yeah, yeah, why don't you go? <laughs> Do it. And so, of course, we moved back and, and, and we're helpful in, in getting this place 
going and started a church. And over the past 15 years, we, we, we have marched through this city. I say march, not like the army, but we're, we're praying for, for, for like every soul, every house in, in this community. Uh, we haven't done it for a couple of years, so there's been a few more houses <laughs> built, built since, then, since then. But we have, we have prayed for this city. We have written names of hundreds, thousands, I would say, people on prayer walls as we prayed for, for lost people in our community. We put uh, thumbtacks on maps, you know, marking people we were praying for and that we were asking God to reach. We've sent out invitations. We still do uh, send out invitations to people who move into the community. We have fed the hungry. We clothed the poor. We have marched in parades. I can say the word march there. Well, I was on a float. <laughs> We've gone into the schools, into the business communities. It's been kind of fun just on these videos the last three weeks, seeing, seeing the, the... I wish you could have hear, heard the, the, the conversations before the videos. Because they were always so cool, like, oh, you guys did this and this and this and this. And I thought, yes, yes, say that. Because they're like, what do you want me to say? You know, just give specifics. Well, how, does it doesn't matter. We're here. And, and then the video cam would be on there, like, real generic. Thanks for being you. You know, I thought, oh, I, you know, uh, <laughs> there's so much more. <laughs> it's so cool. We've done so much as a church. And, and, and it's so cool. We've had special events to the community and said, come on out. Like, like say, trunk or tree. Come on out. Just come to our parking lot. We'll give you stuff. You know, that's all. We just want to hang out. We just want to get to know who you are. And things like vacation Bible school and nights of worship and prayer and things like that. We have the social media presence. Uh, just launched a new website. If you haven't seen that yet, I haven't been to the website lately. Check that out. It's completely new. Um, uh, put their teaching on the YouTube and all that stuff. I mean, we're, we're, we're out there, right? We work all day and all night and all summer and all fall and all winter. But you know what? We can never afford to stop doing what we're doing. We can't. We can't do it. We cannot afford to stop that because one soul makes everything worth it. One soul saved for eternity makes everything worth it. We'll get tired. Over the last 15 years, you've all been tired at different times. We all take our turns, right? You get tired, but you can't stop. You have to carry on. There'll be times you'll be discouraged, and we've all been discouraged at different times over the past 15 years. You've got to pick yourself up and keep going. There'll be times you will be distracted or wounded or feel inadequate. Is there anyone here who hasn't felt inadequate? <laughs> you didn't hear what I really said. <laughs> we all feel... Now, you, now I made you feel bad. No. <laughs> We all feel inadequate at times, like, oh, why me? I can't do this. I'm worthless. I'm blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever. We feel these little whispers, and I can't. And God still uses it. We, we have to get, keep doing what we're doing. The souls of people are too important. We cannot let these things stop us or slow us down ever, ever. There's a scene in Revelation 5 that, that, that fascinates me. I love it. I love Revelation. Uh, however, it can get tricky for people because they, they always get caught up on, on the details. The first thing to realize in Revelation is, is to forget the details. Now, this is great because I'm not a detail guy, so I, maybe that's why I love Revelation. You know, if you get too caught up on, wait, how many heads and how many of this, you know, and you start charting and making all these crazy graphs and you can spend hours on the internet finding all kinds of crazy stuff, you'll miss the point of what Revelation ha has to say. If you try to analyze it and be logical about Revelation, it will frustrate you because John isn't writing a, a theological think piece when he does Revelation. He's, he's using his creative skills in this type, this style of writing. He, he's, he's creating a scene. It's art, right? That's what Revelation is. It's art. And the whole point of Revelation is, is a scene is painted, and you take a step back and you go, oh, oh, that's beautiful, or that's powerful, or that's frightening, whatever it is, and we get so caught up on, wait, how many horns, you know, and how many, and, and that's not the point of, of, of Revelation, it's, it's the scene. So in chapter 4, he creates this uh, drawing, so to speak, mental image of the throne room of God, and this is an artist's interpretation, there's, there, you know, it's just one I found. And, and uh, you know, I don't know any of them could ever do justice to what goes on in your mind, right? When you picture what, what Revelation 4 describes, that there's a throne in the center of, of this space, and it's surrounded by other thrones, and there's flashes of lightnings and rumblings and, and peals of thunder. There's these signs of power, right? Signs of, of, of majesty. There's this ultimate power of the universe in the center, and everything is around it, and they're bowing down, and they're worshiping. These other thrones, other people of power and influence are like, I'm nothing compared to what's in the center of the throne. And it's a beautiful scene of, of, of just the, the almighty, all-powerful, all-present God. 
And then in chapter 5, a scroll is introduced, because the one that's on that throne is holding this scroll. And what's a scroll? What's a book? Right? It's got information. And it's written on both sides. It's filled completely. But it's, but it's all wrapped up and sealed. And what's, what's a seal? A seal is what a king would put on a, a document, a scroll, and the only person that can open the seal is a person who has the authority of the king. If, if, if I decide to open it, I would die. You, don't, you just don't open stuff that's been sealed by the king. This one has seven seals. It is completely sealed shut. You can't read it. You can't get a hint at what is in here. All you know is that it's full of information. And this God of the universe, all-powerful God, is holding a scroll that's completely closed. No one knows what's in it, and nobody can open it except the one he says is qualified to open it. It's described in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, but that gives you a little bit of the scenery. I saw, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? So they're searching to, Is anybody, can anyone open this up? It contains the plan of God. This is information from, from the king, the creator, the, uh, the, the God of the universe. Can anyone open this? It has a great plan in it for mankind, right? Who is worthy to open and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And verse 4 says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. John, John is hit with this tragic thought. There's the plan of God in this, in this document and nobody can read it. And if no one can read it, no one can do it. And if no one can do it, it can't be done, right? It won't, the plan of God will never be done. How can men be saved? They can't. It's impossible. We are lost. Every one of us, we are lost in the curse of Adam. Complete doom. And that hits John and he begins to weep. What do you, what do, you do when there's no hope? What do you do when there's no atonement for the sin, forgiveness of sin, no redemption of man. We're all lost. And he imagines a world without salvation. He, he, hits, he hits bottom. And verse 5 says, one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Don't worry, John. We found someone. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And then you read on, you see that myriads and myriads, thousands, ten thousands, thousands and thousands of angels fall down and worship because the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, could open the seal, could read the plan, could fulfill the plan of God for mankind, and salvation now would be offered. It turns from weeping and anguish to great celebration in the throne room. It's happened. We live somewhere in the between. Because our cities are filled with people who aren't interested. Or don't believe. Or for whatever reason, just haven't accepted Jesus Christ. He's not, he's not Savior. Now, we still live in the situation that Roger read about earlier, Romans 3, we all have sinned. Now, that's, that's not hating on people. That's, you know, that's not like, oh, the church is judgmental. No, that's just, we've all sinned. That ain't, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. Right? Uh, I could give you a list, but that would bore. I mean, you could give me your list. The, thing, the point is, we've all sinned. I don't care what your sin is. A sin is a sin. And we've been separated and fallen short from the glory of God. And Romans 6 tells us what happens when that happens. Uh, because of that, the wages of sin is, is death. Right? That, 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 that when I sin, I'm now separated from God, and there is an eternal death and separation that takes place. Just like Adam, when, when they ate the fruit, now there is separation. Death began at that moment. Now, Romans 6.23 also gives the, 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 the good news in this, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. There was someone who could open the seals, open the scroll, and fulfill the plan of God. Salvation is offered to you if you want it. You still got to take it. 
You still got to do your part. It's not just everybody goes to heaven automatically. It's, it's those who go to heaven who, who want to. <clears throat> See, we did, we did not start a church 15 years ago so that we could have a bunch of Christians to sit around and do churchy stuff. Now, we're a church, so we'll do churchy stuff. I mean, because, you know, that's, that is, we are, after all, church, right? But we, we started Pathway Church because Johnston and the surrounding areas are growing by leaps and bounds, and there are too many people not going to heaven. That's why. I mean, we can go to any church that's If you just want a place to hang out and do churchy stuff, there's lots of churches out there. Why start another one? That's just silly. But there's too many people who have not accepted Jesus. Too many. Here's a basic thing to our faith. And we know this and we understand it, but like we don't live it. Like, like I don't know, we, we kind of push it off. We, we, we try to ferment. I don't know what it is, but, but, but look at this statement. This, this is this. Every single person outside of Jesus Christ is lost. Do you believe that? Believe it or not, it's, it's what it is, what Scripture says, right? Um, but man, we don't live that really, do we? You know, it's kind of comfortable. I mean, it's, it, I don't want to live in, in continual agony. Maybe that's it. You know? I don't want to weep uncontrollably every single day. Maybe that's it. We kind of buffer that thought. But that doesn't change this. Every single person outside of Jesus Christ is, is lost. We can't be okay with this can't as a church as believers we can't be okay with our house being on fire and having five of our children in there we can't be okay to say well we can save three of them i think you know how do you decide which two you don't i mean do, do you really think well that was a good day we saved three of our kids that was that was good you, you wouldn't be happy, you, you wouldn't be content, you wouldn't be okay unless all, all of them, you would go to extreme measures, even risk your life running inside a flaming building to save all of them. Well, Johnston is on fire. Urbandale's on fire. Waukee, Clyde, Windsor, I mean, you know, Pleasant Hill, Altoona. Ankeny, keep going around. It's all on fire. Des Moines, I missed the big one in the center, right? It's all on fire. Now, now we're going to have a party tonight and celebrate 15 years. And that's cool, and that's good, and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. And, and, and you know, I don't want to down that at all. But here's the deal. Tomorrow, we're going to have a parking lot full of kids that are going to come to our parking lot to have conversations with us. You know what I woke up this morning excited about? Tomorrow. Tomorrow we have an opportunity to build some relationships with some neighborhood kids that we don't, haven't met yet. That's what I'm excited about. Oh, the gala's going to be fun, and I bought a bow tie, and you know, it's, I'll look goofy, and, and, and that'll be fun. But tomorrow, tomorrow, that's the big day. A lot of these children are growing up in, in families who just plain don't know Jesus, and their homes are on fire. <laughs> We have an opportunity to extend a hand and say, hey. Now, we may not snatch them out tomorrow, but we can build a relationship so the next time we can put the hand out, they'll be like, oh, I, reckon, I know you guys. And one of these times, they'll say, yes, I'll take it. That's why we do all these little things. Because we keep building these little bridges, little relationships, so we can reach our hand out and snatch them out of the fire, as Jude says. They're, they're grown up in, in families much like uh, the Gentiles back in the day of the book of Acts that uh, served many gods and had many beliefs. They were very spiritual, but didn't really focus in on, on Jesus, which is the only way to heaven, <laughs> right? The only one who was qualified to, to, to fulfill the plan of God, to go to the cross, to die, to be lived up. I mean, he's the only one, the only one. That sounds all exclusionary. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. He's the only one. That's why John wept, because there was no one, and then they found Jesus you know, in, in the play of Revelation 5. 
So Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch in the first century, and, and they're there proclaiming the, the good news, the gospel to Jesus, of Jesus to, to the, the Jews there. That's where they always would go first. And, and the Jews reject the message, and so they began taking the message to the Gentiles, the ones who were worshiping all the other gods, the ones who weren't Jewish and the pagan people of the land. And, and they quote a verse out of Isaiah when they're kind of letting people, hey, we're going to have a change of strategy now. We're going to Gentiles rather than, than Jews. And look what happens. It's in Acts 13, 47. For, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. They're like, yes, we, we get to be a part of this, right? And glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Paul and Barnabas, hey, God's made us a light for you guys. And guess what? It's for you. And they rejoiced and they were excited. Not everybody believed, but many did. And their lives were changed. They're in heaven today, today, right now. They're celebrating. Because Paul and Barnabas were a light for those Gentiles. God has made us a light to Johnston and the surrounding areas that we might bring salvation to the Des Moines area and to the ends of the earth. We're fulfilling what Jesus said, the Judea and Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end is the world, right? We're being a witness everywhere to the whole earth, ultimately, in the things that we're doing. But here's the deal. That light means nothing unless we're actually a light in darkness. We can come into the light and all turn our lights on and say, hey, my light's just like your light. We're all light. Yay! I mean, that's really cool. We come together and worship, and we have to have those times. We have to have those times when we all get together. But your light isn't all that impressive here because we're all light. You know, we're already seeing Jesus. There, there's not a lot of pushback to the Jesus message here. It's, it's where the light is needed is when you go to work tomorrow or later today. It's, it's when you go to your family and, and not all of them believe, or when you walk around and talk to people in your neighborhood and they don't know Jesus. That's when you're light. That's where you've been called. That's where you've been called. I grew up singing the old song. How many of you remember singing uh, This Little Light of Mine? Remember that? <laughs> I loved that as a kid. I don't know, because I was a hyper, and I was, hey, I get to swing my arms and go really wide sometimes and hit people in the head. I don't, I don't know what it was, but uh, it, 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 it reminded me of just what I was for, about what I was supposed to do. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. You know, and we'd be singing, and I'd be all excited, and, and I would take that seriously. And I'd go to school, and I'd invite my friends back to Sunday school, and I'd invite my friends to vacation Bible school, and I, you know, I invited my friends to anything. I, sometimes I'd just say, hey, let's talk Jesus, and they'd be like, what? Can we just play on the slide? Yeah, if we can talk Jesus. I, don't, I just took very seriously this idea that I'm a light. And do you remember how that song goes? Hide it under a bush. No! <laughs> and we got to yell that. that. Maybe that's why I like the song. We got to yell, you know. Like, hey, no! <laughs> Except I was a kid. I thought it was named Bushel. And I thought, a Bushel? Is that like a, what? A bushel? And it was, oh, no. Anyway, that's, that's <laughs> it confused me for a long time. <laughs> Hide it under a bush. No! No! Right? Don't let Satan what? <laughs> Get out. I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> I loved that. And as kids, we, we, we lived that, right? And then we grow up. And what do you do? Well, you go to work, and, and we try to think of creative ways to, to hide it under a bush. Because we're, we're not supposed to be light here. I mean, they get mad. And so you say, hey, are you light? Yeah, I'm light. And so you get a couple lights, <laughs> and you still hide. And you get two or three light, you know, lights hiding under a bush. <laughs> That's kind of what we do. If we get older, I don't know, we don't want to embarrass anybody. We don't want to you know, get uncomfortable. We just kind of hunker under bushes. And, and then life happens, right? I mean, life, life can be cruel. When you're a kid, you think it's all popcorn and, and Christmas and fun and stuff. And then you, you grow up and there's like, sometimes people really don't like you or they're mean. Or, or sometimes they, you, you, there's death and friends and family and, or there's health crisis. I mean, you know, there's life, right? Life that we all face. And guess who's there going? <laughs> That's pretty tough, isn't it? <laughs> You're going through a challenge, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that boss at work, he's really mean. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever there is going on in your life. You know, just life. 
And he's continually trying to blow it out. Now, it's up to you to keep that from happening. It's up to us to, to work together and link arms and say, oh, we're not going to let that happen here. Not here, <laughs> right? We got each other's backs. We have this enemy who's like a roaring lion roaming to and fro looking for someone to devour. He could blow out your life, but oh man. Oh yeah. And so in just the general living of life, our, our lights sometimes get, get blown out. And we have to be careful. We have to guard, we have to be alert, we have to be awake. We have to make sure Satan doesn't get out. Because every soul out there is worth it. One soul comes to Jesus because I wouldn't let Satan discourage me or beat me down or convince me for whatever reason Jesus isn't, whatever, you know, Jesus isn't real or I shouldn't tell anybody about Jesus. Uh, and I turn, and I turn off the light or hide it under a bush. Uh, we're fighting for eternity of people. It was uh, May in 1934. Some, some of you may have heard the story before because it's, it's, it's uh, well, you'll know the names when we get there. Uh, 1934, Charlotte, North Carolina. A farmer lent out his, his farm to some local business people who uh, wanted to commit a day of prayer because in a few months, four months down the line, they're, they're going to hold a big revival and bring in some big, powerful, high-named guy. And, and, and they, wanted, they wanted to change Charlotte, North Carolina. They, they, they wanted to just shake them up, the churches, and, and, and get them on, on fire again, because whatever, you know, it, things happen. The churches kind of fell asleep. <clears throat> and so on the day of prayer, a guy named Vernon Patterson prayed, Lord, please raise up someone out of Charlotte who will preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's a pretty bold prayer, but that's, good, that's a good prayer. I don't know if he thought it would happen or not. I don't know, but that was his prayer. And four months later, an 11-week revival starts. You could do that in 1934. <laughs> uh, uh, throw up a tent and go for 11 weeks and, and go up go for, go for crazy. Uh, they brought in a southern evangelist, Mordecai Fowler Ham. And I decided first service, I need to change my name. That's just kind of cool. <laughs> What's your name? Dan. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> What's your name? i got to look at it. Mordecai Fowler Ham, thank you very much, right? Anyway, that's him. And they brought in song leader Walter Ramsey. So they brought in some great quality music and a great preacher, and they shattered, it says, the, the story goes, the complacency of the church going in Charlotte. But more importantly than that, here's what happened. God heard this prayer that had been prayed four months earlier. The farmer who lent his pastor out to the prayer meeting was a guy named Franklin Graham. His son, Billy, became a Christian during that revival that happened during that uh, big 11-week revival. Now, now, Billy Graham grew up, as you know, uh, may know, may not know, uh, to, to preach in front of hundreds of thousands of people throughout his career. I remember as a kid, back when I was singing the This Little Light of Mine song, I remember going to our neighbor's house, and who was the preacher of that little church, and, and we'd sit in the basement, and his entire family, young to old, were sitting on the edge of their seats watching the Billy Graham crusade, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy, I guess I should listen to this guy. I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I was a believer, but I was like, I don't know, he's just this guy, right? And, and then that's when I was introduced to him, and then for years I heard, heard him preach and, 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 and just was influential in, in bringing a lot of people to knowing Jesus Christ. He, he passed the baton to his son, Franklin, named after his grandfather, uh, who has literally as well taken the gospel message of Jesus uh, to the ends of the world. Matter of fact, the, the little shoe boxes we do are part of the Samaritan's Purse, which is Billy's son, Franklin's ministry that he heads up. And uh, when we went to Oklahoma City a few years ago and, and we connected with Samaritan Purse and we were doing tornado relief, uh, we were you know cutting up things and tearing things out. They have an evangelistic team that is connected with that, that sweeps in and talks Jesus to people. Uh, we do the leg work and they get to do the Jesus work because they're connected to people there. And we go off. You know, it's all part of bringing the message of Jesus to the world. Now, not everybody is not going to be a Billy Graham or Franklin Graham. I mean, it's a cool dream. I'd love to think, man, hundreds of thousands of them. I mean, that'd be pretty cool, right? 
Um, in the real world, we get a little nervous, you know, talking to that person across the lunch table or, or the neighbor down the road, uh, you know, and we're prying into some pretty personal issues with people. Hey, what do you think about Jesus? Uh, don't tell Jesus, you know. So, so we kind of get a little hesitant. But I like what Corey Tin Boom said about that. If I straighten the pictures on the walls of your home, am I committing no sin? I'm, I am committing no sin, am I? But suppose your house were a fire, and I went still calmly about straightening pictures. What would you say? Would you think me merely stupid or very wick, wicked? Your house is on fire, and I'm like, oh, this picture's a little crooked. Rather than addressing the real thing of need, I need to get you out of here. Am I wicked or just dumb? Sometimes, sometimes guilt, dumb. I don't, I'm, none of us are. I don't think we're wicked. We don't, we don't want people to die. We just numb ourselves a little bit to that important statement we said earlier, everyone outside of Jesus is lost. The world's on fire. It's on fire. Let's go out and save some people. Jesus did the work. He's the one who died. You're not, asking, you're not telling you you have to to die. Let's go out and tell some people about Jesus. And, and how about we start with us? I, I, I don't know where everybody's at in this room. Are you right with Jesus? Are, are you absolutely right with Jesus? The, the gospel message is really, really very simple and uncomplicated. Ah, there's different approaches and different ways to communicate it and different you know, outlines you might use. But, but when you get down to just the basics, it's pretty simple. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. Now, now grace, uh, better read the verse, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That's not your own thing, your own doing. It's the gift of God. Great, great grace is getting what you don't deserve. I, I don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve heaven because you're sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. We've sinned. None of us deserve heaven. So God gives grace and offers heaven. Doesn't automatically give it to you, he offers it to you. Grace tells us the cost of salvation. It doesn't say the process, doesn't say how we're saved, it just says this is how much it costs you. Nothing. I'm gonna give it to you. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. Can't, you know, that, that's the cost. Secondly, we're saved through faith. Now, this is important. Faith is more than just a generic, oh yeah, I believe in God. Because most of the people you talk to say, oh, I believe in God. A generic, maybe, maybe the God we know from here. But maybe a generic God, it can also, they can use the same verbiage and, and, and means, you know, mean something different but say the same thing. Uh, so it, it's much more than just saying, yeah, I believe. Uh, James says in chapter 2, verse 19, you believe God is one, you do well. I like the NIV, well, you know, good, right? Uh, uh, even the demons believe and, and shudder. So, so that's, you know, that's not impressive, just saying you believe in God. There's more than saying a simple little little belief. Faith requires some type of, of action. Just before he says this, he tells us in verse 17, uh, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It means nothing. I believe in God. What have you done? Nothing. Well, it, it, you know, you don't. <laughs> or at least it means nothing. It's an empty faith. It means nothing. If you've done nothing, right? You have faith. I have, so, some of them would say, verse 18, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from my works. I will show you my faith by my works. This is James saying, this is the proof, this is the action of my faith. You can't just say, I believe and hope, hope that, that that works in me. I'll just naturally show up in heaven because I kind of have a vague belief. No, no, no. There's got to be something connected with it. In other words, faith is action. It's defined by what you do. I get into a whole theological thing there, but it's, that, that, that's, that's important. So what does one do? Well, one, one thing is Repent. And it's clear throughout Scripture, repentance. Uh, repent, therefore, turn back to God that your sins may be blotted out. What's repentance? It's turning around, it's changing. I'm living my way, I'm going this direction, I'm doing my own thing. God's over there saying, over here, here's where the plan is. I've got the scroll. Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he was resurrected, he's paid for your sins. If you want to come, come this way. Repentance says, oh, okay, I'm going this way. Doesn't mean you have everything figured out. Doesn't mean you're sinless from here on out. It doesn't, you know, you're still a human being. You're still going to have issues. But it means I'm going this direction. I'm, repent I'm changing my, my direction to live for God. That's repentance. That is absolutely necessary. Without that, there is no salvation. I don't care if you have a simple faith in God. You're not going to heaven. That's, that's a pretty bold statement. But that's what it says in Acts. 
Turn back and your sins will be blotted out. Uh, baptism. Mark 6, 16, 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Pretty, pretty clear. Pretty, pretty clear there. In, in the first sermon of the church age, and no, the church hadn't been established yet. Jesus had died, buried, resurrected, ascended back to the Father. The church is the the followers are hanging out. What do we do next? Before the church happens, the Holy Spirit comes, and, and the apostles are there, and they're, they're preaching and teaching, and Peter stands up and gives a sermon. And at the end of the sermon, people are, are cut to the heart, Scripture says. They're cut to the heart, and, and they obviously have faith. At this point, they're going, okay, we believe. What do we, what do, we do now? What do, we, what do I do with this faith? What do I do? It's described in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, or 30, 37, excuse me, to 38. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter, and the, the, the Jesus message, the gospel, uh, they, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Jesus, Peter said to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You will see the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll tell you what to do. You believe, that's great, that is awesome, that is good. Now, now that faith means something. You repent, turn your life around, get baptized. Yeah, that's it. it's, not, it's not that complicated, is it? We can get into all kinds of theological discussions about that. That's just what it says. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do what Peter said. If you're ready to repent, start living for God, that's you dead right where you're at. Just, just, you just, we're going to sing a song, and you just use that time to pray to God, saying, God, I just, I just want to live your direction. I'm going my own way. I'm headed my own direction. I'm going, it's not working. I, need, I want salvation. Uh, <laughs> I'm on fire. I want, I want this fire put out. I want to go your direction. That's repentance. And, and action you know, follows that. So actually living that way. But it's, it's, it's repentance. You do that wherever you are. Uh, if you can't remember personally making a decision to say, I want to be baptized and declare my allegiance publicly with Jesus Christ, identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, if you can't remember you personally come up a, coming up with that decision, I want to give you an opportunity right now uh, to do that. Um, matter of fact, we just had a baptism in between services. Uh, water's warm, it's fresh. I've got shirts. You saw the video. I've got shorts. We got towels. But the thing about Billy Graham that he always did uh, that was fascinating was he had these big invitations, and, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people would just pour down. I don't know if you ever remember or if you saw any of those. Even on TV, you just see these hundreds just pouring down to the front um, and, and uh, wanting to connect with Jesus. A lot of churches uh, used to do that too. I grew up in a church that did that every single week. And, and probably the reason we don't do that, I've explained this before, is we did it every week and we just kept singing until someone came. You know? and, and, and so it was just kind of like, okay, this isn't even real. This is like, you know, I, I, I think my pendulum probably swung opposite, maybe too far. So we've done this very few times. But what we're going to do, we're going to offer you the opportunity while we're singing a song to just come and say, yeah, I'm ready right now. And we'll baptize you right now. Um, we got the stuff. Uh, people can come and go. They can do what you need to do if someone wants to do this. Uh, like I said, we had baptism in, in between services already today. Uh, and that was in a, in, a, in a group of people that in my heart of hearts, I was thinking, why am I even saying this? No one here needs this. <laughs> but that tells you how much I know. <laughs> tells you what I know. Band's going to sing, well, we're going to sing, and I'm going to hang out right over here up front. If you're ready to do that, I'll be waiting for you. Let's stand together. Let's pray.